and welcome back to the series on the series of magnetism lectures delivered by Ken Wheeler. In the previous video, we established that he is a charlatan with the trademark nonsense word salads. But up till now, he hasn't really made any claims. So maybe he will get to the meat and potatoes this time. Okay. Oh, great. Koros or field. Did you just put that one up there to make yourself look impressive? I cannot think of any other reason why you might stick that up there. Let's go on to the second section of my lecture on uncovering the missing secrets of magnetism. This will be on what magnetism is not. Uh, a really short conclusion based upon the evidence of what uh, current magnetism is uh, explained as, which of course is both amusing and rather frightful. Ooh, goody, let's see how you are going to fuck this one up. I am going to bet that you don't have any understanding of the theory you are trying to disprove, but go on. Um, there's an interesting ancient Greek word. This word is akoros, a uh, word for field. You ever want to uh, stump a modern uh, PhD, a doctoral physicist, just ask them to find a field in itself, of itself, by itself. We'll always stump them because they haven't got a single explanation. Hmm, yeah, okay. A field is just a quantity that can be represented by a number or a tensor, and it has a value for all points in space. If you're not a physicist, then that is probably not a very satisfying definition. But yeah, that's it. Um, let's get into it, and uh, after the second edition, we'll go in directly into magnetism. What defines a magnet, lines of force, uh, polarity, and what defines magnetism? And uh, understand this conjugate magnetodielectric uh, field geometry that uh, has perplexed mankind since uh, the beginning of time when they found lodestones. They've been using them for thousands of years, mostly for ship navigation, but also for uh, rich children's amusement as well as adults. And uh, we have uh, all this uh, crusty and uh, nonsense actually stacked up upon what we think magnetism is or is not, and this notion of magnetic attraction, which of course is an absolute absurdity. But this is due to the uh, inherent deficiency of human sensory input. We th see two things accelerate towards one another, then we think attraction. So we've uh, had thousands of years of magnetic attraction and notions of polarity in our head, and uh, all of this is an absolute absurdity, and it's not understanding what magnetism is, nor its relationship to the dielectric. Well, when two things are attracted to each other, they accelerate towards each other. Let's suspend disbelief for a moment and accept that whatever you are going to say in this lecture is correct. You would still be describing a mechanism by which two magnets attract. Uh, let's get started. Maxwellian field equations, be it Gauss, Coulomb, Faraday, or Amper, define fields only over a given vector, time, magnetic permeability, and dielectric permittivity, also called the electrical constant. These are changes measured in effect they never define a field in itself of itself. I don't think you fully understand this, but a field is an abstract concept. It kind of comes in from the notion that physics is a description of nature and not an explanation. As I've said before, explaining nature is like explaining reality and what reality is. And this is not testable. Therefore, it is philosophy, not physics. Particle fantasies, the deformed and mentally inept machinations of the cult of quantum, or as I call it, the cult of bumping particles, cannot be enjoyed by rational or intelligent minds. These are the same intellectual insanities of reifying space as something that did things or acted upon things. These are the remnants of Einstein, for which Tesla called Einstein a fuzzy-haired crackpot. Tesla also railed heavily against the notion that space had any properties. Space has absolutely no properties, nor does it act upon things. Okay, Tesla was a genius, but he was also very wrong on this one, as is demonstrated by an overwhelming body of evidence that we've collected over the last hundred years or so. He, of course, did uh, denote the fact that space has attributes, but it has no properties, nor is it a principle. 
just as a shadow was not a thing. A shadow was a privation of light. We have uh, countless concepts within human conception, such as space and time and uh, shadows and emptiness and chaos. These are uh, pathetic human conceptualizations which do not exist in the cosmic mechanics toolbox of Mother Nature, if you will. Fields have no quantity, that the realm of physics has co-opted uh, the definition of fields as an absurdity. The quantified effects of cause and effect interactions measured in either joules or watts or amperes is denotative and descriptive, none of which explains what a field is, nor magnetism specifically. I'm starting to see what your issue is. Can you define something without describing it? Quantum mechanics has utterly co-opted the definition of magnetism along with the source of quantum's religion, that being light. But quantum is atomistic. Its very foundation is built upon the wave-particle duality, of which light is certainly not a particle, and a wave is absolutely not a thing. So you haven't understood the whole wave-particle duality thing. All right, cool. But you are aware that this is all experimentally verified, right? But what a thing does. This is the premise of Mother Nature according to GR and QM, respectively, in general relativity and quantum mechanics. Virtual particles, warp space and sanity, negative momentum particles, gravitons, quarks, gluons, you know, big bang, black holes, uh, absurd definitions thereof. Uh, space, of course, a black hole is neither black nor is it a hole. Space, which is neither a force nor field acting upon things. Mother Nature, according to general relativity and quantum mechanics, is a uh, cross eyed cooker, cross eyed hooker on crack. And I do mean that literally. It's completely illogical. A field is completely... Now, this is a quote from Charles Brody Steinmetz. Well, I like Steinmetz greatly. He does say some rather absurd stuff in his voluminous writings. And this is, of course, the same sort of uh, illogical and insane nonsense we see today. So this is from uh, Steinmetz. A field is completely defined at any point by its intensity and direction. Well, Mr. Steinmetz, intensity and directions are properties and attributes. They're not explanations or even complete descriptions. There you go again. And again, I ask, can you define something without describing it? This is another one from Steinmetz. We can define a field as a condition of energy storage in space, energy storage in space, exerting a force on a body susceptible to this energy. Well, space has no properties, and a condition is not a thing, but an attribute something has, like saying, my condition is I have the flu, further still exerting a force. A force of what, upon what, and by what. This is the premise of general relativity and quantum mechanics. This is their own definition. The magnetic field between magnetic dipoles, it is caused by the exchange of virtual photons. Really? Isn't that interesting? You know, these are not the inputs or outputs of experiments, by the way. Apart from the fact that quantum electrodynamics is one of the most successful theories ever developed? This is uh, from Maxwell. This is an accurate statement. Hmm, okay, you are going to quote Maxwell. Let's see how you ignore his work. Remember that Ken Wheeler asserts that Maxwell was right about electricity and magnetism. This medium of propagation, the ether, must exist. The medium must be a prominent thought in our investigations. This is from his book, Treaties on Electricity and Magnetism. It is the case, and this is absolutely undeniably so. When you remove the ether, you must necessitatively replace it with particle fantasies and messenger particles for interactions, especially actions at a distance. These absurd mental constructs are not the inputs or outputs of any experiment ever done, as I've already said. Bingo! You do know one of the reasons why the ether was assumed to be there, right? Maxwell's equations predicted that light traveled at a constant speed, which is problematic in Galilean relativity. Constant with respect to what? So, they decided that it must be constant with respect to something in an absolute reference frame, and that there must be a medium which is stationary with respect to this reference frame. This medium is called the ether. I go into that a bit more in the previous video. Now, Michelson and Morley showed that the ether is not a thing. Of course, you can take electric and magnetic fields as the ether, but we've already have a pretty good name for all of that. Aside from the speed of light, a more important reason why the ether was hypothesized is that light has a wave-like nature. And they thought that a medium was therefore necessary for the propagation of a wave. And let's rewind for a bit. And a wave is absolutely not a thing. Yeah, do you not see how this is problematic for you? See, here's an insane definition from uh, Tom's, uh, Tom, uh, Tony Skirme 
And uh, this is another particle fantasy to define magnetism. Such skirmions are quasi-particles. They do not exist in the absence of a magnetic field. So here's another unicorn particle. Once again, this is not part of any experimental input or output. It's just, it is literally a brain fart like unicorns or leprechauns. Why am I still surprised that you will cherry pick and talk utter nonsense? Tony Skirm is talking about a skirmion, a quasi particle in the sense that it is not a single particle. It is actually a configuration of the field which can behave like a particle. The quasi bit is actually quite important. Oh, and for the experimental output bit, here are some images. I currently work with two undergraduates who are building a system which allows us to study these things. And these people are PhD doctoral uh, folks within the universities and uh, yeah, teaching, teaching children, teaching, well, high school kids, I mean, college kids. Oh yes, isn't it a travesty that educators are actually qualified in the subject that they teach? These, this, this is their position, by the way. This is from Walter Russell. Nothing is more fantastical and a travesty of how nature works than its quantum theory. Its very basis has no relationship whatsoever to reality. Most so-called so scientists today are not scientists, rather mathematicians, and fundamentally, if it can't be quantified and counted by a mathematician, then it doesn't really exist in their eyes. Again, you demonstrate your complete lack of understanding of science. Let's go back to the basics. A theory needs to be falsifiable. Experiments need to be repeatable. For this to work, experimental results need to be quantifiable. Otherwise, you cannot compare the results to the theory and test a hypothesis. Mathematics is a tool that eliminates human bias and allows us to transcend the limitations of common sense. Your dismissal of the use of mathematics in science is, in itself, a dismissal of science as a whole. Well, will you look at that? I suddenly changed clothes. I've decided to cut the video here and split this one into two parts. So far within the YouTube world, Ken Wheeler has been relatively unchallenged and I understand why. His material is rather impenetrable due to what he presents and how he presents it. With flat earth, anti-vax or climate change deniers, it is always relatively straightforward. You pick up on a point, say it's wrong, and then continue by demonstrating how it is wrong. And then you throw in some jokes or snarky comments. You then move on to your next point. However, the points that your subject then makes generally have some grounding in reality. Okay, it is a complete misunderstanding of reality, but at least the subject is actually close enough to the ballpark to see the lighting at the horizon and you can then compare their nonsense to reality. However, with Ken Wheeler, his nonsense is so far removed that they don't even share a basis for comparison. One could say that the two are incommensurable. In part two of his lecture series, he doesn't even get to the main points of his lecture, yet there is just so much ridiculousness that it is hard not to fall into the trap of commenting on every mistake he makes. Because if you were to do that, then you would be interrupting the video every other word. I think that I've managed to avoid this trap, but still, I feel that my treatment of this video resulted in a product which is a bit much. If a YouTube video like this approaches the length of a standard television episode, then it really is too long. So with that, I will sign off and you will catch me on the next part on lecture two, which will follow shortly.